member here at this church, and I am so excited to have Jerry and Carolyn Parr with us this evening. You'll hear lots about them as they share, but Jerry spent 23 years in the Secret Service. He guarded four vice presidents, two presidents, number of foreign dignitaries, and has some remarkable stories to share. His wife, Carolyn, is an attorney. She spent a 15-year term on the United States Tax Court. Um, so just fabulous people. I read their book in the Secret Service last fall when it came out. And when I read it, I just fell in love with this couple from afar. Not only the history, I love history, and feeling like you just have a front seat view to some amazing history, but just the way that they live their lives and how they blessed other people is, is just remarkable. So I'm grateful to have them here this evening. We're gonna start with just a short little video clip and then they will share. Um, at the end of the program, we will have a book signing out in the foyer. We've got the In the Secret Service at a special price, so they will be happy to stay by and autograph copies for you. So we'll go ahead and start with the presentation. My dad and I used to go to a, a lot of movies because uh, he was out of work it was the, during the Great Depression. And so uh, we would go to the Tower Theater, which was several blocks away. We had to walk. And we saw a movie called The Code of the Secret Service. And the actor in that, well, the main actor, but played the part of an uh, agent named Brass Bancroft, was uh, Ronald Reagan. With the president, there was more press, more crowds, more threats, uh, more people on the outside, more people hollering, uh, more demonstrators. Well, when he's about uh, probably six or seven feet from the car, I heard uh, these shots. I sort of knew what they were, and I'd been waiting for them all of my career in a way. That's what every agent waits for, is that. And so since we were only about six, seven feet from that car and the door was already open, the most natural thing to do is to get his head down and push him real hard into the car. And I went in on top of him and Ray Shattuck, my shift leader, threw our feet in and slammed the door shut. And as soon as that was shut, I yelled to Drew Unruh, take off as fast as he could. And so he just pressed on the accelerator with nobody in the right front except the driver and the, the president and me in the back side, in the back seat. And, and uh, somehow, intuitively, I, I, well, I just looked out the back window as we were moving, and I saw three bodies on the sidewalk. I thought, uh, we're, we're clear. But then he started spitting up blood, uh, about DuPont Circle, underneath, you know, you go under DuPont Circle. And so I uh, looked at it and I said, uh, I'm taking you to the hospital. He would look pretty bad. I asked God to uh, let him live. Lord, let him live. I mean, I got right over his face and said that. I don't think he heard me, but his eyes were open. I don't think he heard me. It was such a strange thing that me, seeing his image on a film when I was nine years old and then ended up helping save his life, really grateful to Lisa for setting this up and for all of you for coming tonight. What we're going to do is I'm going to uh, set the context uh, for what Jerry's going to read and he's going to read um, from the book. The, the first uh, thing we're going to read is uh, the first day, Jerry's first three days at work in the Secret Service. He was already 32 years old, and uh, his first assignment was in New York. Uh, <clears throat> so the first day 
Uh, he met the boss who was very scary, very stern, very strict, all cop. And uh, all the agents were scared of him. And in fact, when they had to meet with him one-on-one, -on -one, they called it going to confession. <laughs> and uh, so Jerry was, you know, awed by this guy. And uh, now they have weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks of training. But then, here's what they did. They handed him a gun and said, show us if you can hit the target. Took him to a shooting range and he shot it. And he did and they gave him the gun and gave him some handcuffs and gave him a commission book and said, now you can arrest people. So it was on the job training for about six months and then they went to school. So the second day they gave him a, a big thick manual and here's what happened on the third day. <clears throat> The third day was the uh, driving test. Mr. Whitaker put on his gray felt hat, a well-blocked, elegant hat that he wore proudly and with authority. Putting on his top coat, he tossed me the keys to a 1961 Studebaker Lark and growled, I want to see if you can drive. Take me for a ride. I tried to exude confidence, but as I caught the keys, my hands were trembling Driving in Nashville traffic was nothing compared to Manhattan. I wasn't really sure how I'd measure up. I drove him along and he didn't talk. The silence magnified the tension. Do a broken U-turn, he rasped. I didn't know what a broken U-turn was. So he said, well, just stop and turn the car around and go the other way. This is all in Manhattan traffic. So I did that, but I was nervous. I felt it was, I was if, if I was starring in a slow motion scene from a movie, turning left across three lanes of traffic, jerk, jerking between fast and slow to avoid being hit by angry drivers. But I made the turn and let out a sigh of relief. We resumed at about 35 miles an hour when I hit a pothole. There were no seat belts in those days and Mr. Whitaker flew straight up and the force of his encounter with the headliner crushed his hat, pushing it down over his ears. He, did it. he didn't say a word, neither did I, but my thoughts were pounding in my head. This is the end, I'm ruined and I'm fired. Then he said very quietly, son, pull the car over. I want to get out. I stopped the car. We were about two miles from the field office, blocking, blocking a lane of traffic. Taxi drivers blasted their horns and gave me the finger, and people on the sidewalk stared. Mr. Whitaker stepped from the car, blocked his hat, and he put it back on. He leaned in the passenger window and he said, Reb, if it had all been like you, we'd have lost the Civil War. And after that, he walked off and never mentioned it again. Jerry, being a Southerner, thought that was a compliment. <laughs> I'm not sure that Mr. Whitaker did. Um, then Jerry rose in the ranks slowly. He went from New York to Nashville when President uh, Kennedy was murdered. Uh, he went to Dallas for a few days to be there and help out. Then he went to the ranch to meet the new president, Lyndon Johnson. Uh, and then he came back and was on Hubert Humphrey's detail. Now this is the 1960s and most of you won't remember but there was great turbulence in the country because two things were happening. The, the um, what do I want to say? The civil rights movement was very active. Martin Luther King was leading that and there were demonstrations all over the country and uh, then there also were very strong demonstrations against the Vietnam War. And so everywhere the, Jerry and went with Vice President Humphrey, he got stuff thrown at him, he got yelled at, they were like the enemy. Not from the civil rights people so much as from the anti-Vietnam people. Uh, and uh, so Jerry was torn by this because he sympathized with wanting to end the war, but he was the one that they were attacking because they were attacking his boss, Humphrey. And uh, Humphrey was against the war himself, but he, he was the vice president, and the president was Lyndon Johnson, who was staying in the White House. So we come to 1968, which was the very worst year of all. That's the year Martin Luther King was shot. 
Robert Kennedy, the president's brother, was running uh, for office, and he was shot, was running for president. He was shot on the night he won the California primary. Um, and uh, Jerry is there now. It's the Democratic primary. He's with Humphrey, who is trying to get the nomination. And uh, they're looking down on a crowd of very angry protesters and very angry police. <clears throat> The title of this chapter, chapter five, is 1968, The Year from Hell. From the 26th floor of the Chicago Conrad Hilton Hotel, Hubert Humphrey and I looked down on a scene from Dante's Inferno, a chaotic mix of police horses and National Guard struggled to prevent a crowd of demonstrators from bursting out of Grant Park onto Michigan Avenue and entering our hotel. The twin scents of marijuana and tear gas invaded the lobby and wafted up through our open window. It was August 28, 1968. Both demonstrators and police were exhausted and very angry. When a demonstrator tore down an American flag, furious police who had been holding back for days finally broke under the stress. I'm still haunted by their by the crisp rat-a-tat-tat sound like galloping horses, hooves striking pavement, horses that did not slow down, horses that kept coming without a pause. This was the sound of billy clubs hitting demonstrators' heads, a sound rising up 26 floors and spilling into American living room through their television sets on the nightly news. Humphrey turned pale. No one could have plumbed the depths of dismay that showed in his face. He looked heartbroken at what was happening, what was happening to those young people. And he must have known the scene of violence would be played and replayed over and over on national television. I think he intuited that what was happening below, what he was helpless to prevent, had already doomed his candidacy. You remember that Humphrey was defeated by President Nixon and uh, President Nixon's vice president was Spiro Agnew, who was the governor of Maryland. And uh, <clears throat> Jerry went with him. Then he, Agnew had to resign in disgrace. And uh, he, Gerald Ford became vice president for a short time. And then he became president when Nixon did, resigned because of the Watergate scandal. So there was a lot of stuff going on in the country. Uh, and eventually, Jerry became head of the Secret Service Presidential Protective Division. So that's the top agent at the White House. And President Carter was his first president that he protected in that way. Uh, there, some of you will remember that during President Carter's term of office, uh, some Americans were taken prisoner, taken hostage in Iran. Some Iranian students invaded the U.S. Embassy and took our employees uh, prisoner. And they wouldn't let them go. And uh, Carter tried every kind of diplomatic move he could think of to get them released, and nothing was working. So uh, here's what happened then. When President Carter, while President Carter sometimes took chances with his own personal safety, safety, he never wanted to risk harming others. But in desperation, he approved of a highly dangerous secret commando mission to, to free the hostages by force. In the pre-dawn darkness of April 25th, 1980, eight helicopters rendezvoused in the desert. A fierce sandstorm struck, forcing three choppers to return to their ship. At least six helicopters would be required to carry everyone out, and only five remained. The mission was aborted. Then things got even worse. Preparing to leave the desert, but before taking off, eight men were killed, and at least one survivor was horribly burned when a helicopter collided with a C-130 support aircraft at, in a refueling operation at the site. The United States was humiliated. With the element of surprise now blown, another rescue attempt would be impossible. The militants immediately dispersed the hostages to different parts of Tehran. After that, Carter almost never smiled. 
I saw him losing weight. His grief for the hostages was now magnified by losing the rescuers. And I imagine he grieved for his own helplessness. A week after the failed rescue, he said, Jerry, I want to fly down to Texas, so keep this quiet if you can. I don't want any publicity. The president and I flew to Lackland Air Force Base in San Antonio, where I had done my basic training some 30 years before. No press knew of the trip. Our destination was Brook Army Medical Center, where a surviving pilot was being treated for severe burns. As we walked into the hospital, I flashed back to Clark Air Force Base in Manila when Humphrey, with Humphrey 13 years before, where I witnessed firsthand the horrors of war. But this was my first time with burn victims. The Vietnam burn victims were sent to Japan. At the burn center, a doctor led us to a huge window through which we could see a large room with several beds. Since this was peacetime, only one was filled. The lone patient was swathed from head to toe in bandages. Only his eyes, mouth, and nostrils were exposed. A nurse attended him. The only sound was the hiss of oxygen tanks and the musical ping-ping of machines connected to tubes that ran into different parts of his body. He's conscious now, the doctor said, but we don't expect him to live. President Carter said, I'd like to go in and speak to him. May I? The doctor hesitated. He was, after all, in the U.S. Army, and his commander-in-chief stood before him. But he wanted to protect his patient. After an awkward, awkward moment, he explained his dilemma. He's totally vulnerable to infection. We have to maintain a sterile field. If you go in, we'll have to dress in surgical greens and cover your nose and mouth. Carter readily agreed. We both changed our clothes, covered our hair and shoes, and put on face masks, facial masks. But then Carter looked at me, and I thought, he wants to go in by himself. He wants private time with the man who sent him into a situation that may have killed him or ruined his future. And I recall Jesus' words, all who humble themselves will be exalted. And I thought, the president is humbling himself, and this takes a different kind of courage. The president was physically vulnerable, but the president was making himself emotionally vulnerable. I said, Mr. President, I don't have to go in. I'll just watch through the window. Carter entered and stood beside the soldier's bed. Like the patient, only the president's eyes were visible. He said something, and the soldier turned his head away very slowly toward the sound of the voice. Then this man, wrapped from head to toe in bandages and in unspeakable pain, raised one hand and, and saluted. Carter returned the salute. Watching the window, gratitude filled my heart and spilled down my cheeks. I knew I was witnessing a supreme act of compassion, a holy moment born of mutual pain and forgiveness. When the president came out, Neither of us said a word, but there are times when silence is more profound than words could ever be. As far as we know, this is the first and only time the story has ever been told. It really was kept a secret. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, now, uh, President Carter was defeated by President Reagan, and Jerry went right from one to the other, uh, because the Secret Service is not political. They protect the right of Americans to elect their own president. And so whoever is president uh, is protected by the Secret Service, and an agent's own personal like or dislike of the person has nothing at all to do with their willingness to give their life. Um, so Reagan, this particular morning, which was very early in his term, uh, was making a speech at the Hilton Hotel and just happened that I worked across the street from the hotel and my window looked right out on the scene and Jerry had called me and told me the president would be there and said if you want to see him you could come and maybe you could meet him. I had not met the president yet. I had already always met everybody else Jerry um, protected. So I thought oh that would be cool. Uh, but I got uh, distracted by a phone call, and I forgot about it. 
And uh, when I hung up the phone, I kind of swiveled around in my chair thinking about the phone call, I looked down the window, and I saw that the road was cut off, and there were, it was clear that the president was down there. There was this motorcade, cars were sitting and waiting, and I thought, oh, shucks, I miss the president. Well, I'll go down and stand on the sidewalk, and maybe I'll see him come out. When I got downstairs, I decided not to go across the street because I thought it's not good to distract Jerry when he's trying to work. I'll stay over here. So I was across the street from the shooting when it happened. And uh, I heard the shots. And what I saw was I saw President and, the president and Jerry go down behind the car. I saw the car speed off and three bodies were lying on the sidewalk. So I'm going to read a couple of paragraphs here that describe what was happening to me, but they're in Jerry's voice. <clears throat> At the moment we careened out of the hotel driveway, Carolyn was tearing across the street, desperate to identify the three bodies she saw lying there. Agent Bob Wonko, holding an Uzi, which is a 9 millimeter submachine gun, screamed at her, get back. Dashing to another part of the sidewalk, she saw Press Secretary Jim Brady lift his grievously wounded bald head. She knew he wasn't me. Then she heard a woman screaming. Realizing it was her own voice, she clapped a hand over her mouth to stifle it. In desperation, she ran back to Wonko, who was watching her. I'm Jerry Parr's wife. Where is he? He pointed, in the car with the man. In the car, I was half sitting, half kneeling on the floor before the president. Checking him for blood, I methodically worked my hands around his body from the belt line up, under each arm, along his back, neck, and head looking for blood, feeling for a wound or a painful spot. With immeasurable relief, I assessed that he had escaped unharmed, at least for the moment. But there was no telling what dangers might be still lurking. We needed to secure the president. I radioed Shattuck in the follow-up car, Rawhide is okay, and we were going to Crown. I had a choice to make, head to the ultra-secure White House or divert to George Washington University Hospital. I chose the White House. But about 20 seconds into the run, I noticed the 70-year-old president was pale, and he grimaced every time he took a breath. I asked, is it your heart? I don't think so, he said in a soft voice. Then matter-of-factly, factly, I think you broke my rib. I caught my breath. All I could think of was, God, I hope not. The president took a napkin from his pocket and, reached, and he touched his lips. It was filled with blood. I must have cut the inside of my mouth, he said. But I remembered my 10-minute medicine class, which reported to us that frothy, bright red blood was oxygenated, a sign of a lung injury. My own heart was pounding. My head was clear, though. Maybe I hurt him when, I, when he hit the riser. What if I punctured a rib? What if I killed the president trying to save him? His pallor was now gray, and his lips were blue. He was breathing and becoming more labored. As we passed through the tunnel under DuPont Circle, I made a decision Mr. President, we're going to GW Hospital. I saw concern and strength in his eyes. He didn't argue. We left the follow-up car and, and the entire presidential motorcade in the dust, but they managed to catch up. Unruh radioed Marianne Gordon, Agent Marianne Gordon. We want to go to the emergency room of George Washington. The lead police car overtook us, and we went in front as usual. What was not usual was there was no agent in it. That meant they didn't get the radio message of a revised destination and sped on to the White House. Marianne Gordon pulled ahead of us to replace the lead car and take the brunt of any traffic we might encounter. I grabbed Unruh's mic. Mine had been torn off at the belt when I hit the limo floor and ordered Shattuck, get an ambulance, I mean get a stretcher out there, let's hustle. Our sirens were wailing as we tore the hospital on Washington Circle. Should I take a shortcut and go the wrong way around the circle, Andrew asked. Seconds were precious, but I had, I said no, the last thing we needed was a head-on collision. We screeched to a halt at the GW entrance at, at 2.30 p.m., just under three minutes from the time we peeled out of the Hilton driveway. Shag leaped out of the follow-up car and opened the door. I climbed over the president, extended my hand, but he didn't take it. 
Though pale and gaunt, he was determined to walk in on his own steam. I was on his left arm no more than two inches away. Shattuck was on his right. Dale McIntosh and Russ, Russ Miller caught up with us to create a circle of protection around him. As we walked about 20 feet, the president's eyes suddenly rolled back in his head and he dropped. Shattuck and I caught him as he collapsed. Nearly 200 pounds of dead weight, the four of us and an ambulance attendant carried him to trauma room, in trauma room five at the George Washington emergency room. You all know what happened after that. The president lived 23 more years. Um, but what happened to Jerry is he, he continued to work for four more years. He was promoted to be assistant director of the Secret Service, and then he retired. What he did was he decided, instead of taking a corporate job for security, as many agents do, and that, that's a perfectly wonderful thing to do, uh, he decided to go back to school and get a master's degree in pastoral counseling. So he did that. Meantime, we moved from Maryland t into the district. Our kids were grown up by then and had left home. And uh, it was closer to my work. And uh, we joined a little church called the Church of the Savior. And <clears throat> that church is very committed to helping people who are in distress, helping poor people or sick people or uh, people who dropped out of school and need uh, a GED, helping immigrants. and So there are many missions of the church. And when we joined, we decided we needed to do something that would take us out of our comfort zone to be part of this community. So we volunteered to work at the Gift of Peace which was an AIDS hospice started by Mother Teresa. You have to know, and it was started for homeless people. There was nothing poorer than the poor than a homeless person with AIDS in the late 1980s and early 90s. There was no cure known for AIDS. It wasn't a disease as it is now where you can take a whole lot of pills and you can live a long time like you'd live with diabetes or something else. Then you died was 100% fatal. So it was kind of scary to work there, but we wanted to do that. And so every Sunday night, we would arrive at 6 p.m. and leave at 6 a.m. And um, I was a judge at the time, and I didn't tell the guys there at the AIDS hospice what I did, because many of them were ex-prisoners, drug addicts, all had left pretty sorted lives, most of them, not all. And uh, I wanted them to just be comfortable with me and like me for myself. And Jerry didn't tell them what he, his career had been. And uh, I didn't tell the people where I worked that I was working at the AIDS hospice because I knew the other judges would be completely freaked out if they knew it and would be scared to <laughs> shake my hand or eat with me or anything else. So um, we were leading kind of a double life there. Uh, but I really enjoyed coming, coming every week and just being received by these guys for who we were instead of for what our status was. And it was, it was refreshing and wonderful. Um, so we're going to read you something from this part of our life, which was a ministry part. There are other things we did in ministry too, but I thought we would just read this one thing. There was a man that named Franklin. That's not his real name, but that's what I'm calling him, uh, who was a patient there. And when we first got there, he was the kindest, gentlest, sweetest man. He could still walk around, and he would help with the other patients. He'd help wash them or feed them or bring them water or whatever. And they all loved him so much. But gradually, he got sicker, too. And uh, so now he's bedridden, and he has delusions sometimes. And at night, one night, he called us, and so we went to him. <clears throat> One night we heard, volunteer, volunteer, and recognized, Francis, and, and, rec and recognized Franklin's voice. He was not unable to walk, and the virus had hit his brain. He, he began to have delusions. Once he asked about the dog in his room, and I said, Franklin, I don't see the dog. He just said sweetly, oh, I must have imagined it. Another time he thought Carolyn was his sister. 
but he had lost none of his gentleness, and, and, and the other men adored him. Before lights out, someone was always in his room, joking with him, talking seriously, praying or holding his hand, as he had done for others. When we answered Franklin's call, we were distressed at what we saw. He had soiled himself and was obviously in great pain. We put on gloves and I began to clean him up while Carolyn set about changing the sheets. When we rolled him over, we saw a huge open sore that took up almost his entire left buttocks. As I washed him, I uncovered him with, covered the wound with salve. Franklin cried out, thank you, Jesus, sweet Jesus, sweet Jesus. We got him all cleaned up and it came over to me to take Franklin's hand and say with as much faith as I could muster under the circumstances, God loves you, Franklin. And then Franklin looked straight at both of us with his depth, depthless eyes and said, I love you too. Not God loves you, but I love you too. Now, others might think that this was just a demented man making a socially acceptable response, but to us it was a life-changing affirmation whose source was beyond Franklin and beyond death. We had, been Christ, we had been Christ to Franklin, and Franklin had been Christ to us. Like the pair on the road to, the, to Emmaus, who did not at first recognize Jesus after the encounter with Franklin, we couldn't shake the feeling that we had been addressed by the risen Lord. Okay. That's, we're going to end it there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you, Jerry and Carolyn. From all of us, I hope you all enjoyed this as much as I did. Can you see why I love these folks? And you've just heard a few of their stories. Their book is full of stories that just show the, the power of God's love in their own lives and how they dealt with situations and circumstances. So, so grateful, again, that you came out this evening to share with us. Uh, Jerry and Carolyn are now going to go out into the hallway. They have a table set out up there, and they will be available to talk with you and to autograph books. We've got the books for sale out there at a great price tonight. So I encourage you to stop by, talk with them, um, have a book autographed. So thank you all for coming. Tell you I'm grateful again Cause it's more than